Good afternoon, Las Vegas, and welcome to the MMA Fight Corner here on Fox Sports 920 in Las Vegas and streaming worldwide on FSR920.com. That's FSR920.com. For your host, Heidi Fang, Joey Varner, Filthy Phil Devine, I'm your referee for today's action, Dave Carney. And we'd like to thank our sponsor of this morning's uh, program here, Dr. Richard Rothman of LASIK of Nevada. And you know what, guys? We all know Billy Mira, and he went to Dr. Richard Rothman, and Dr. Richard Rothman actually made this guy look look at himself in the mirror for the first time, and he thought, wow, I'm a handsome dude. Dude, he's the second guy to, since Jesus to t- make the blind be able to see. That's right. And, and Billy was blind as a bat. Sure was. Billy would like wa- go, go to walk towards an open door and hit the wall, and he'd take two steps back and walk into the damn wall again. Billy, for 10 years, thought he was a good-looking dude. You know, until Dr. <laughs> Richard Rothman helped him out with that. And uh, anyways, that's that's just one of the great things that we have here on the show is the ability to see clearly, thanks to our friend uh, at LASIK of Nevada. But guys, we have a huge show today here on The Corner. We're going to be breaking down the entire UFC 159 card that it went down this last Saturday in Newark, New Jersey. It was an unbelievable night. So much to talk about. We're going to start off with Joey, Phil, and Heidi breaking down the Jones Sun and fight, but we're also going to get into the Bisping Belcher, the Nelson Congo, the Miller Healy fight, and Davis Magaliainz. I'm trying to get that uh, that name right here for my good friend Joey, uh, who I know with Vinny being a friend of yours, I'm going to be interested to hear what you have to say about this. But guys, let's start off with Phil. And Jones and Sonnen, okay? We talked about this a lot last Friday here on the corner. What a great big fight this was. We were all looking forward to it. Chael, obviously the underdog. Jones coming in, you know, undisputed light heavyweight champion. Give me your two cents on this fight here, Phil. Well, the fight pretty much went down the way we expected it to as far as John uh, dominating the action. But uh, I was very interested to see him actually. His game plan was to beat Chael at his own game. And, you know, uh, Dana made a joke about it a few months ago with Damian Maya and John Fitch where where Damian Maya pretty much took John Fitch out of his game by John Fitching him. He outfitched yeah. well, Fitch. Out Fitch, Fitch, Fitch. Exactly. Well, <laughs> Jones out Son and Son in the other night. Yeah, sure did. And, you know, coming back here, Joey, I, wa- I want to bring you into this one as well because – you know, obviously, with you being our resident fight expert and fighter yourself, you, you have a really keen understanding here of the MMA game. And, and you had mentioned, like Phil was talking about, the kind of approach that Chael would probably try to take if he were to usurp John. And that was, you know, a real aggressive, you know, put your head down, rush the guy, rush the guy, rush the guy. And that's exactly what John did. So tell me a little bit about that and why you think John went that approach as, as, as opposed to his normal rhythmic fighting style. Well, you know, that was actually exactly what Chael did do. Chael did rush out there, get in his face, try to back him up, tie up the dirty clinch. And early on, he was effective in that clinch, in the tie-up, in the dirty boxing game. I mean, he was landing some nice uppercuts in there. And we always talked about the the wrestling of Chael Sonnen and the striking of John Jones and the anti-wrestling of John Jones, the fact that John Jones was a junior college collegiate national champion, that, that, you know, he does have the wrestling tool, but we always thought he would use that defensively. And here he came out, and none of us actually talked on this, and I didn't hear any too many members of the media actually, uh, the media actually touch on this factor either, but he used his wrestling offensively. He took Chael down. He put Chael on his back. And uh, early on, Chael was was effective. He was able to kind of get his hips under him, scramble, get back up to his feet. But John just changed levels again. And it was impressive because John changed levels against the cage, went for the double leg, transitioned to the single leg, hit the dump. He was using some high-level chain wrestling that was really, really impressive and highly effective. Well, and Heidi, let's let's bring you into this one as well because you had a chance to, to hear John on that UFC conference call that we played some parts of uh, last week on the show. And John was taking a little bit of offense to the, to the perceived slights, I guess, against his wrestling. Now, carrying off of what Joey said, how do you feel John really kind of approached this fight? Was this to prove any doubters of his wrestling wrong? I don't know if that was necessarily the 
uh, fact that he had it in mind when he went into the cage, but he did manage to pull that off if that's what he was looking for. So he's definitely put that aside, and like Joey said, he's used it offensively for a change. You always see John with the sprawl, the defense, never really being the aggressor on the takedown, and there it was right in front of you. And what he did with it was pretty amazing, including the adrenaline-packed moment where he broke his toe in the process of a ground and pound. Mm. Yeah, we've, we've seen him use the wrestling just not like that. He's used it before, like against Brandon Vera, where he hit a sneaky little trip. And uh, Matsushenko as well. It's been these little kind of like uh, Greco-Judo hybrid sneaky trip moves. But this was actually pure go back to the wrestling room, back from the mat, you know, collegiate wrestling at its finest. I'm still trying to find out which members of the media or which fans or who in the <laughs> hell has ever <laughs> even made a comment about John uh, yeah, wrestling. About John yeah, wrestling. That was kind of that was kind of crazy. I, when I heard that I was like, "Wait, what is he well, saying?" You, you know, to me, John represents, you know, I think the first in line of these UFC athletes that that has the ability to transcend the sport, it, you know, into to levels that it's never seen, right? Because he's such a super athlete. And you know who who does things like that? Muhammad Ali used to do things like that. Michael Jordan, you know, the Kobe Bryant, okay. the, the John Elways of football. They'll use perceived slights in order to pump themselves up, real or imagined. There's a big difference between everyone on that list and John Jones. Now, if you had thrown LeBron James on that list, I would have said yes. Okay. To him only and no one else. And the reason is, is how many of the, those guys walk out to, how many times did Michael Jordan walk out to the Bulls stadium? How many times did, did Muhammad Ali walk out to, to a fight? And the or, or weigh in for a fight. How many times does Kobe Bryant show up at the Lakers game, and the whole audience boos him uh, all this, the time? Yeah, this guy really? Yeah. <laughs> Every yeah. road game that these guys no, go I, on. No, I said that in his backyard. The Lakers oh, go to Lake because because this is this is this was Jones' backyard. What in New Jersey? Yeah, uh, New York. Well, he's he's, he, a, New York he's a New York guy. Yes, he New trained Jersey. with the bomb squad uh, upstate New York, but he used to also go down to to Garfield, New Jersey, which is right near. Sure. So okay. I'm saying that, right right near that area. He got, trained with Mike Masenzio. Yeah, he got booed bad. So maybe, okay, so. He's like, he has this, he has the skill to draw the, the, the sponsors. He has a skill to memorize the layman fans, but the people just aren't feeling John Jones personally. It's because he's better than everybody. And I Go wonder ahead. if no, it just he acts like he's better than everyone outside the cage. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> if it had anything to do with the cancellation of UFC 151 and that just rubbing all the wrong way around that, it. That will always uh, follow him, but I think yeah. it's that will always be something I think it's a combination. Him. I think you take this guy who's gone out and he's taken this very uh, – uh, high road. I'm the whole. I, I'm holier than thou attitude. Like yeah. I don't curse. You know. He's. I'm very upset because he said he'd beat my ass. I don't curse because the, the Bible told me not to. You know. Well, you know. Thank you, Jesus. You know all this stuff. And then, then he's getting busted at a strip club. Right. You know. He's getting a DUI. With well, he, 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 he was there to uh, convert the Mary Magdalens of that strip club. Well, actually, uh, you know, know it, 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 <laughs> Mary Magdalene. You know, now to look at the back of the history, I Mary Magdalene wasn't actually a prostitute. Okay, that okay, was a listen, defamation we're, thing. We're going to have, we're, we're, we're gonna have a whole we're, different we're, show yeah. based upon uh, that. And we've got a whole lot to talk about here. So, guys, I'm going to uh, quickly transition. Phil, we're going to start with you. Bisping Belcher. Bisping wins by... A decision, okay? So Belcher surgically repaired. Eye gets poked. You know, we were all talking off air a little bit about this. What were your thoughts on this fight? And, and was that an on purpose eye poke? Uh, was it on purpose? I, I don't know. I don't want to speculate. It happened. It was an odd night. It happened to quite a few guys. Um, one of the worst nights of incidents like that, uh, pro that I can remember. I've yeah. never seen play. And, and for Joe Rogan to actually make that comment on air that say this night is cursed. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, speaking of curse, did you hear the devil screams? That yes. I, I didn't hear any of that. I just it read about it all It was between rounds one and two, uh, Fizz being Belcher, and it was like, <laughs> <laughs> it was like playing uh, it was Nick the Tooth, Sabbath I think. backwards. I, 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 I think I it was Nick the Tooth hopping on. The, <laughs> hopping on uh, so, so what happened was, just so everyone knows, is there was a point in, in the fight night, and a lot of people on the forums online said it happened numerous times, where there was some kind of noise going on throughout the audience that, that the microphones playing on pay-per-view picked up that sounded like, Devil, demons, rah, monster, something like that. So people were all on the forums, all the places. Who heard the devil? Who heard the demons? You know, wow. but it just is appropriate for this 
Curse hey, I was going to say, and also we might want to cut down on that cycle. If, you, if you're listening right now and you're hearing the devil in your radio, yeah. go ahead and knock that cycle off for a couple of weeks. Come back to us, and then the devil won't be with you anymore. Um, but anyways, Bisping Belcher, great fight. So, Phil, uh, you know, what were your thoughts overall of the fight uh, and what Bisping you got? You know, I, expe- I expected more out of Belcher, but Bisping did what Bisping always does. He used his combinations, his speed. He was very effective, um, you know, used good movement, and... Uh, Belcher, I don't know if there was an injury either. There was something going on in the beginning of the night, uh, right, right when they walked into the cage with the tape on his ankles, and he, he looked very flat-footed. He didn't look like he was moving around too well. I don't know if that was an issue, but it definitely is. It's a, it's a real shame uh, that he got poked in the eye and that it did happen. You saw him bleeding out of it instantly. I think yeah. he got numerous stitches in his eyelid. Um, you know, I, I hope he comes back okay, but you know, three times, your, your same eye getting messed up. You know, not good. Not great. I'll tell you what, Phil. You didn't want to speculate as to whether the eye poke was intentional or not, and I don't know either, but, but when someone, right after they poke a guy in the eye, turns to their corner, which he did, it's on camera, turns to his corner, gives him a big thumbs up, and then starts throwing his hands up in there like he's celebrating. Damn, that doesn't get more intentional of a celebration, you know, post-injury than anything I've ever seen before. Uh, it's it's kind of like celebrating a, a really bad low blow, right? You know, so this you, thing's you, you never like you, 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 you tackle the guy on the floor field illegally, he's down. He's injured. Yeah, the whole place, the stretcher comes out, and you're cheering for it. Right. It was an old Tank, tank Abbott and John Matua. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. that is a little different there. Okay, but, but <laughs> in, in all honesty, though, this has happened with Bisping before. We know Bisping's not a sore. I, I, he's a sore winner. If you you look at him, I mean, look at the George Rivera fight. He went and spit on the corner. He talked trash to Rivera, you know, after the knockout. He's not a, a very gracious winner, Bisping. Yeah, no, and I, I do want to move on because we've got a lot of other fights to, to cover. Nelson, Congo, uh, you know, Miller, Healy, and Davis Maglianes. But real quick, before we do that, uh, Heidi, since you had an opportunity to get that interview w- with Michael last week, w- real quick, what are your thoughts? Intentional, not intentional, I poke. I don't think it was intentional, but it's did happen, and I agree with Joey that he shouldn't have been right off the cuff celebrating when a guy's bleeding out of an eyelid that required eight stitches. Okay, cool. Well, we're going to quickly transition. we got about a minute and a half left before we take our first break here on the MMA Fight Corner. If you're just tuning in, uh, you're listening to Joey Varner, Phil Devine, Heidi Fang, Dave Carney. Uh, we're going to talk about the Nelson Congo fight here. So, check Nelson. Mm, wow. Big, big knockout, right? That's how. That's exactly how I think all three of us saw it going right. down. I, I mean, you called it, Joey. So why don't you take us through real quick on this one? And what did you see in the fight? You know, was there any surprises for you? No, there was no. Yes, there was surprises. Actually, I take that back because Czech Congo is 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 a highly skilled striker. He's supposed to be a very intelligent striker, and what is he doing with his back against the cage, circling towards his left with his left hand? very very low he's just inching 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 into the right hand he's moving into the right hand of Roy Nelson that was almost as dumb as Michael Bisping circling to the right hand of Dan Henderson yeah Czech Congo basically sent uh, Roy Nelson an evite to uh, knock him out he's like <laughs> basically hey got here you go it's right here take it you know you want it and what I absolutely loved about it was you know when Heidi and I we went to that pain and gain thing with Roy Nelson a few weeks ago he was talking outside when Heidi was talking to him and interviewing him and he was saying he's like no you know listen I'm going to get that title shot because the fans are going to demand it. He goes, it doesn't matter where I'm ranked. Okay, Sonnen got the fight. I'll get my title shot. And look what you saw him do right after that fight. He played up to those fans. And he was trying to get them to love him. He's looking for that belt. Hey, you know what? We all do what we got to do. We want everybody to love us if possible. And coming back here on the MMA Fight Corner, we're going to have much more of this love fest with Joey, Phil, Heidi, myself. We're going to talk about the rest of the UFC 159 card. We've also got a very big interview coming up later in the show. So be sure to stay with us right here on Fox 920 in Las Vegas.
Fight Corner. Fight Corner. Live from the Fox Sports 920 studio in Las Vegas. And streaming worldwide on UFCRadio.com. All right, welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner here on Fox 920 in Las Vegas and streaming worldwide on FSR920.com. That's FSR. 920.com, Dave Carney along with your hosts, Heidi Fang, Joey Varner, Phil Devine, and we're breaking down the UFC on 159 card that happened this last Saturday night in New Jersey. I know New Jersey's not quite New York, but guys, do you think that, you know, with all the stuff that's up in the air about, you know, about the UFC going to New York, is New Jersey as close as the UFC is ever going to get to New York? Well, I don't know, because at least they were able to hold, like, those um, media week of the affairs that they had right. in the middle of Madison Square Garden, and I think that's where they did the open workout. So at least in that aspect, it's you know, has some kind of influence in New York, but, I mean, uh, I would hope that eventually down the road that it does get a little bit... Uh, more, uh, you know, in it gets to the assembly floor at least. Yeah, well, at least. You know what? They they actually got some help finally because you know, uh, me, Phil, and I both have this pulled we up. Right pulled it up at the same time. No, I pulled <laughs> it up before <laughs> the show started. I was right, mine was on before I was the show reading started. Uh, I was reading it right here. I, I read it this morning. I, I read it. I, I read it with Insider <laughs> at the Wall Street Journal. Oh. Okay, so Dana's been crying, and everyone in the UFC has been crying that there's been a conspiracy almost that the, that the culinary union yeah. is out to get them. They're playing dirty, but you know what? It hasn't really been a, a legitimized, uh, legitimized outcry yet you know there hasn't been a legitimate backing of that story well that changed today right phil yeah finally uh, and it's not like you know the you know east pecune journal put this out it's not some small little town the thing Podunk Daily. They, yeah, <laughs> the, yeah exactly uh, the wall street journal you know ex- put out an art uh, an, uh story in today's paper uh-huh. it's called ultimate dirty fighters in albany and it's about the congressman and they they have all, they have first off they've listed all of the things that the legislation in New York and and the politicians and the culinary union have done to side stri- sidetrack the UFC's you know expansion into New York and to halt it, such as putting up websites. Oh yeah, there's three, there's three we- different we- websites that are up right now that are anti UFC that have this out there. But now let me let me throw this to you because you know we talk about you know what are the reasons for the UFC not being in New York? Well, one of them, the biggest reason, it has nothing to do with MMA fighting. It has to do with Lorenzo Fertitta and his brother who own the largest non-union employer in the state of Nevada and have played every single dirty trick that you can play against the union in every public forum here in Nevada, which people in New York would have no way of ever knowing about. This is the union's way of saying, hey, listen, you're taking it to us. We can't unionize in your places. How do they play a dirty trick? Well, they well they started an ad campaign, basically demonizing the culinary union here in Las Vegas over a year ago. That's you know a little beside the point. I mean, we've but got a lot of that was their retribution. And that was their retaliation. Maybe and years. Uh, I mean, this has been going on for years. Well, and New York though is a highly unionized state. That's the other. That's the other problem with that. The unions carry a lot of weight. I mean, remember this is where a lot of that started. Uh, was right back there in New York. So, anyways, I just was going to ask if that Jersey thing was as close as we're ever going to get this is a story though guys i think as we're all going on uh the mma fight corner we're going to be updating this because it's a big deal for us obviously here in las vegas we get to see the top fights because the ufc was started here but let me, let me just throw one more thing out okay. how dirty this gets um the 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 assembly uh, uh, you know speaker whoever this scumbag and if you look up a picture of this guy he looks like a scumbag from a movie politician scumbag politician like when you see okay. what's this, the difference uh, Sheldon Silver okay he, he the, the 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 bill comes to the floor and it's it, the eyes are nays you know you raise your hand you vote yay or nay yeah so he says nay twenty percent of the floor raises their hand. He says, I, like who's in favor, Right, 80%, sure. and the guy says, up, oh, looks like we don't have enough votes. Yeah. It doesn't get more anti-democratic, more dirty, sleazy, scumbag, piece of crap politician than that. Yeah. And just so Agreed. you know, the New Jersey State Athletic Commission is actually the very first athletic commission that came up with the legal rules of mixed That's martial right. arts. Yep. Okay, it was Nick, Nick Lembo. Nick Lembo, all right. And they were one of the first supporters. And Las Vegas, or Nevada's athletic commission basically adapted it from, from, New, from Jersey, New Jersey, and yep. everyone else did. UFC's first two shows under Zufa, UFC 30 and UFC 31, were held in Atlantic City. Yeah, right. and, and you know, it's one one time, the only time that it, we're going to take a cue in Las Vegas from Atlantic City because we know they're just totally biting our <laughs> style back there in Atlantic City. All right, but guys, so we don't get too off track because we do have a really big interview. We're waiting patiently to hear 
uh, if we can get on the line uh, Luke Rockhold, who's going to be fighting in the main fight on the FX8 uh, in Brazil this upcoming May 18th. So we're going to be standing by for that. But let's get back to a couple of these other fights. And, Joey, I'm going to start with you because this is a friend of yours, Vinny Magliainz, okay, versus Mr. Davis, okay? So Davis beats Magliainz in a unanimous decision. You were talking a lot about Vinny's fighting style over the last couple of shows. You, you've trained with him. You've seen him do stuff. Tell me a little bit about this fight, and did it end exactly the way that you thought it would? No, it didn't end exactly the way it did. And I'll tell you what, uh, you know, I, I, di I wasn't a fan of Vinny asking for this fight. I just thought stylistically it wasn't the best fight for him to move forward in his career. But Vinny wanted, you know, Vinny being a fighter, Vinny being a, a hungry fighter who wants to take on a top 10 fighter, he called for this. Um, I actually expected to see, you know, Vinny's cardio to kind of come into play and him to lose a step, slow down a little That's bit. That's what you were talking about last week, yeah. Because it's been, a, it's been an issue before in the past, and uh, I, I thought Phil Davis would, you know, use more wrestling in the second and third round, take Vinny down once he lost that step, once he wasn't as quick and explosive with those submissions, and use his top game to, to ground a pound. But this turned into be a kickboxing fight, which happens a lot of times when you get two grapplers, two, two great decorated grapplers, you know, and they stop grappling, they start kickboxing. Um, Davis outstruck Vinny everywhere when he rocked him with a head kick. He picked him apart. But Vinny was, you know, he was never out of the fight. He was always in the fight. His cardio showed great improvement, you know. And uh, I, I loved I loved hearing his corner after that first round saying, hey, you're letting this guy get off first. Mark Beecher, great kickboxing coach, said, you need to go out there. You need to throw first. And to his credit, in that second round, Vinny came out and he tried to do that. But Phil was just better on his feet than Vinny, and uh, and it was his night. And it was funny because one of the judges gave Vinny, um, I'm assuming, the first round. And Vinny tweeted afterwards. He goes, I don't know what that judge was thinking. <laughs> I never won a round. Davis beat me fair and square. I liked and you had Davis yeah. afterward at the press conference saying Vinny came up to him afterwards, explained, hey, it was nothing personal. I'm just trying to promote the fight. Remember, Vinny's been training with Chael for the last couple of years. You know he's going <laughs> to. You know, <laughs> took a Vin page from Chael's book. Exactly. Vinny's been teaching Chael jiu-jitsu, okay? But. Chael's been teaching, teaching him, Vinny, uh, you know, American trash conference. talk. Trash talk suit. All right, so, Heidi, let me let me bring it over to you then. Uh, you know, let's talk about the Healy upset of Miller. Okay, so this is the fifth professional loss and, and the second time ever that, that Miller was finished. So what are your thoughts on this one? It was insane. I mean, a lot of people, I don't think, not that they looked past Healy, but that they didn't expect him to be able to have the skills to beat Jim Miller. But when you look at him in there, they almost look like the same guy. A little bit. Yeah, and uh, it was Battle totally... The, the ginger beard. <laughs> it was totally funny <laughs> that at the end, you know, Bruce Buffer actually makes that mistake and calls uh, the winner Miller, even the fact it was Healy. But, right. I mean, it was great for Healy to come out there and show that kind of prowess. I mean, from being one of the strike force fighters and having such a tall task ahead of him, those guys have come in hungry, and he got the uh, double bonus there, submission of the night, fight of the night. It was only the second time, like you said, that Miller was ever finished. The first time was Nate Diaz. Um, for Miller, it's kind of uh, a, 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 I guess a period of where he's going to have to reassess himself and see what he uh, can do to come up with a big win. You know, what's funny is we had talked about this the other day, how was, they were such carbon copies of of each other and you know we thought going into this fight that everything you know Pat Healy did Jim Miller did better you know and it reminded me of that movie remember with Michael Keaton multiplicity yes where, like he got yes. cloned and every diluted time he got every cloned down, it got yes. diluted a little bit and a, a, you know a lesser version so <laughs> when the fight ended I, I tweeted I was like I wonder how it feels to be you know, tapped out by your clone, <laughs> you know, <laughs> taking over. It's like, you know what? Thanks for giving me my life, all right? And I appreciate everything you did, but it's my turn to shine yeah, right now. You, you know, well, well, you know what? In, in breaking down this fight, I thought it was going to go down for the whole fight, like the first four and a half minutes, four minutes of the first round. Miller was just too quick. He was better on his feet. He was in and out. Healy wasn't fast enough to get a takedown. Um, but Miller showed me that he is not the brightest candle on the cake. We interviewed him months ago, and we asked him about you know his 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 lack of success at the top level when it comes to take on you know everyone he's lost to. He has been either title contender or champion, you know. And what does he need to do to change that? What does he need to do differently in his training camps? And he said nothing. He said some days it just goes your way, sometimes it doesn't. A lot of it has to do with luck. And for me, that was just the sign of not a very bright fighter. But then to hear him go back to his corner after the first round and after the second round, and they told him the same thing. They said, Jim, 
Stay away from the fence. You're too fast. You're lighting him up on the feet. He can't take you down to the open. Against the fence, he's bigger. He's getting you down. And what does he do right when he comes out? He circles to the fence, and he does this the whole fight. He brought Pat Healy in this fight. And then to compound the issue, to make matters worse, when he's on bottom, he has the distinct advantage on his feet. He's lighting this guy's up. He's way faster. Pinned against the cage. What's he trying to do? Get back to his feet where he's more effective? No. He's trying to hit submissions from bottom pinned against the cage. There's no room to move when you're trapped against the cage. You've got no angles. There's nothing you can do. He's just, uh, 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 you know, not even being able to get any kind of submission offense going from bottom, but he keeps on attempting to do that. Jim Miller let me down. Well, all right, you know, and, and I can see, obviously, you feel very strongly about that. But, you know, in, in, you know, in talking to Miller a couple of months ago, it transitions me to somebody else that we talked to. Uh, you know, just last week, uh, Heidi was able to get on Sarah McMahon, okay, who defeated Sheila Gaff, okay, in her first professional, excuse me, first UFC fight. So I want to piggyback off of what Joey said. You know, talking to these guys on our show here on the MMA Fight Corner gives us a little bit of a different insight than other folks might have about these fighters. Sarah was adamant with us on the phone that she would not experience nerves because of her Olympic style wrestling. Heidi, you thought maybe that she was going to. How do you think she fared here in her first UFC fight? Actually, I didn't think she was going to. But um, the point is, in the uh, the whole fight itself, I think she landed probably the quickest takedown <laughs> in UFC history. I'm not even sure about like <laughs> the stat tracker, but I mean, that was by far one of the quickest takedowns I saw. She made it her game right away. She didn't let Gaff get in there and do what she's best at which is being on her feet and striking uh what i love best was the ending i mean she's in a mounted crucifix and just grounding and pounding away at her until it forced the rest stoppage but what i liked about the uh, sarah mcmahon fight was at the end in the press conference she was saying you know i must have done six interviews in a row where people were talking to me about the octagon jitters <laughs> and i was starting to wonder do i have them is that going to happen to me but then she said you know being in that uh, olympic wrestling match for the gold medal and you know taking home the silver that she did didn't feel it at all because of that. It actually said that the questions that the media had asked her, and she said she got it from six shows in a row, and I'm guaranteeing yeah. one of them was us, yeah. and, <laughs> and, and from and from three people on the show because I think you, Joey, and, and and Heidi, I think you brought it up, but you're right, you didn't really believe she would, but yeah. Joey, you were you were kind of thinking like this and this is hey, a Daniel different. Cormier, well, well, yeah, like Cormier, just, yeah, exactly. I, I didn't know if she'd feel him or not. I was just saying. Another Olympian yeah, absolutely. justified going into a fight that his Olympic background would prevent him from having those, and he still had that. And, so I, that's think, I, just and I think that's what caused Sarah to really reassess it because she said, oh, wait, maybe I will. So she started talking to some people. Sure. And she spent the last week really, you know, educating herself on what it's like. And I know that's, that's, it's nothing you can actually really prepare yourself for until you're there. But, I mean, with the training that she's had, she's got probably has the closest chance. I, I'm going to tell you what, though. Ronda Rousey and, and any other female in the UFC that's thinking that this is going to be somebody they can overlook, Sarah McMahon, they better think again. She is going to be, I think, one of the top fighters in the women's division here for a long time, as long as she wants to be. And she looked dominant in, in that fight. And, and here's the I thing. What, 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 what we saw from her isn't what we usually see from her. She, she fought a smart fight. She had a very experienced striker at her hands with devastating knockout power who, co who comes out guns blazing, basically sprinted right into a double leg, and she took full advantage of that. Took her down, secured the position, you know, got the crew fix and put her, cru crucifix and put her away. But usually, she uses her wrestling defensively. She likes to stand and bang, and that's why I think she'll do phenomenal against Ronda Rousey because I think she'll be able to use that wrestling to keep it on the feet, use her striking to to take it in waters where Ronda's not as comfortable. Yeah, and you know what? We're going to post up on our website at MMAFightCorner.com. Maybe in the next couple of weeks, that Joey found a great lookalike for Ronda Rousey. I don't I don't want to blow that, but we're going to do a little match this face thing and see if we've got a lookalike. So, <laughs> Heidi, uh, we've got about a minute here before we take our next break, and again, we're waiting for a phone call uh, from the FX8 main card Luke Rockhold fighter coming up on May 18th so we're going to be staying tuned for that so with about a minute and a half left Heidi you had a little point to cap off on the Sarah fight I think. Oh just that I was very excited to see that now there's a third woman in the UFC bantamweight division that is undefeated Kat Zingano, Ronda Rousey and Sarah McMahon. Yeah no that's that's great okay so we've got about 30 seconds left I want to hit on this real quick because this is one of the other fights we talked a lot about uh, Brian Caraway and the submission on Johnny Bedford 
Phil, we'll start with you real quick. Your thoughts, surprised, not surprised? Uh, not su- Well, not really surprised. I am surprised that he did win taking the fight on short notice against Bedford. But Bedford, you know, w- wasn't prepared for the grappling of Caraway. You know, Bedford's a good fighter. Okay, he's got the knockout power. And we had kind of expected that maybe he could have, you know, turned the lights off of Caraway. But Caraway's actually never been knocked out. You know, and, and but he had, let, had got some good shots landed on him by Bedford. But, uh, you know, impressive win for Brian Caraway. Yeah. All right, guys, when we come back, we're going to be, like I said, waiting for that phone call from Luke Rockhold. But we're also going to be talking more about the UFC 159. whole bunch more coming up here on the MMA Fight Corner. You're listening to Fox Sports 920 in Las Vegas and worldwide on FSR920.com. Welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner here from the Fox Sports 920 studios in Las Vegas and streaming worldwide on FSR920.com. That's FSR920.com. If you're just tuning in to the MMA Fight Corner, you have missed a great and action-packed first half of the show. We've been covering the UFC 159 card that went down this last Saturday in New Jersey. It was really like, you know, Phil, Heidi, and Joey have been talking about one of the most cursed cards that I think the UFC's ever seen. The amount of fluky business that went on in in this whole fight card is just unheard of. And, you know, hopefully, guys, this won't happen at, at, at future fight cards because nobody wants to see, you know, folks getting you know, unnecessarily injured if the John Jones toe, you know, didn't come out and Sonic, you know, we've got a champion that gets absurd. Very strange stuff. But we've got online with us right now, guys, a, a gentleman that's going to be fighting this upcoming May 18th, the FX8, coming at us from Brazil. Luke Rockhold is on the line with us. Luke, welcome to the MMA Fight Corner. How are you this morning? I'm pretty good, man. Just on my way to practice. Ready to kick some ass. Great, great, great. Well, you're on with Heidi, Joey, and Phil. Uh, I'm going to start off here with Heidi. Um, Heidi, let's tee it up with you and with Luke. Uh, you know, first of all, give him some questions here. What do we got for Luke? <laughs> I am, I no doubt have some questions for you, Luke. First of all, this is a huge test ahead of you going into face Vitor Belfort. Um, where do you see your advantages stacking up in this fight against him? Um, I think my uh, my advantages is uh, everywhere, really. I mean, Vitor obviously has fast hands. He's got good power, but you know, I pose a lot of problems myself. I have longer fighter. I got, I got better kicks than him. You know, I, I believe my, my advantage is on the ground and wrestling, you know, in the distance on the stand-up. So, I mean, I got, I got plenty of ways to win this fight. And, you know, most of all, it's, I, got, I got more heart than Vitor. I think I'm more of a man than Vitor. Speaking on that, you know, you say that you're more of a man, you've got more heart. A lot of the strike force guys that have been coming in have this huge momentum behind them. You guys are hungry, you're, you're willing to fight at just a moment's notice because, you know, of what you guys have been through with that promotion and transferring to the UFC. What are your thoughts on that and coming in riding that momentum of the strike force wave? You know, I got 
I'm motivated for every fight I get in, and, and uh, especially when I got a, a good opponent in front of me, like like Vitor, someone who poses, you know, some challenges to overcome. So I, it's, it's not so much coming in on strike force; it's it's just it's just fighting in general. It's uh, I think I think our guys in strike force have been as good or better for a long time, and and people are just finally starting to realize that we're coming in and we're, we're kicking everyone's butt. I mean, it's uh, I think you know Cormier won be the top contender in the UFC. Josh Thompson beat another top, you know, UFC fighter. I think Gilbert Melendez won that fight for the title. And then and then you have Pat Healy coming in and beating the Jim Miller. So, I mean, it's like all our, our top guys versus their top guys, it's, it's uh, I mean, we're winning fights. You know, obviously they're winning some fights too, but, I mean, it's same same caliber of a fighter. <laughs> You were the last Strike Force middleweight champion. Do you feel like with this fight, if you can bring home a win, that you're worthy of a title shot? Um, you know, I, I'm focused on Vitor, but I, I don't see how that you know could could warrant a title shot. I mean, uh, if Gilbert's getting the media title shots, I I defend him about twice and taking out a top contender like Vitor. Uh, why wouldn't I? Luke Vitor in the past tested positive for anabolic stero steroids use here in Nevada and he has been approved outside of Nevada for testosterone replacement therapy which you know Nevada State Athletic Commissioner Keith Kaiser said he wouldn't be ever approved here he probably wouldn't ever be approved anywhere in the states so that that means that most likely the remainder of his fights are going to take place in Brazil but what are your thoughts on the fact that he did get in trouble for using steroids in the past and now he's legally allowed to use them in a fight I mean I, I think it's a crock of shit <laughs> personally uh, I, I think uh, you know I, mean, I don't understand uh, Nevada like set the standard I think from, from both other states uh, and it's like NBA and baseball, it's like not if they, if they travel overseas, they're not going to be permitted to use steroids just because they're, they're playing overseas. Uh, I think it's, it's crap. But, uh, you know, at the same time, if, if they're not going to punish them, I will. And uh, I, I believe it hurts you in more ways than it helps you. Well, what are your thoughts on, uh, on the fact that because of his steroid use, he has to only fight in Brazil, and you're going to have to go into his backyard and, you know, and, and face what, one of the most hostile crowds in, in all of mixed martial arts? Uh, man, I, I'm just I'm fired up about it. It just fuels me even more. It motivates me to train, and, and uh, it's just a little, little chip on my shoulder every, every day and in the gym, and so you know, I'm pushing myself like, like nobody else. And, uh, you know, it's, we'll see how hostile they are. It sounds like I got a lot of some fans out there. And, uh, you know, once, I think once I beat Vitor, obviously I'll, uh, I'll bring everybody to my side. I mean, from what I hear, a lot of Brazilians don't like Vitor. I mean, I, 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 they don't like his cheating, you know, ways and, uh, and, and just, you know, certain things. I've gotten a lot of support on social media for the Brazilians. So I, I don't like, you know, I'm, I'm excited. It's a free trip to Brazil. I get, a, I get to get paid, and I get to kick someone's ass. <laughs> that, that definitely sounds like a good time. And when you get paid to kick somebody's ass and you get to get paid to go to Brazil, nothing's wrong with that. Uh, this is Phil Devine here, and we're on with Luke Rockhold here on the MMA Fight Corner. Uh, Luke, we've had issues with uh, people in the past where they've had to travel to a foreign country, and they're not really accustomed that last week or so getting ready with a weight cut can't get food that you're normally used to, you don't know what's in the ingredients. How have you prepared for this? You know, I'm just going to be, you know, I'm going to be on point. I'm going to take care of my diet when I'm to get there. I've, I've uh, been to Brazil. I've competed in a Jiu-Jitsu World Championships there back in 2006. So I, I have a, somewhat of a feel. I mean, I was there for two months then, and then uh, I was just went to the press conference. Pretty clean food, and... Uh, you know, as long as I got a sauna, I'm going to be all good. So <laughs> nah. I'm going to bring my Adeline, help me cut weight for my sauna. And, and uh, I mean, I, I think they got good food there. They got a lot of fruits and uh, vegetables. And, 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 you know, the weather's a little more humid, so maybe I can maybe even, even be easier for me to cut weight. <laughs> oh, that, that's optimistic. Um Leading up to Dan Henderson's fight with uh, Machida, you got to do a little training with Dan. What was that like? Uh, yeah, I've been training with Dan his last few camps, helping him out, and uh, it's, always, it's been a great experience. Dan's a, Dan's a legend, and, uh, and he's, you know, he's, they got a great team down there, so uh, it's all, he's just a good guy, too. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't like training with people just because 
you know, their, their status. But, uh, you know, if you're a good, good guy, I mean, I'll you know, look forward to training with you. And uh, Dan is that guy. And their team is just a good group of guys. And, uh, you know, it's good being down there. Uh, now, this past weekend, you know, you heard uh, Dave bringing in the show and he was talking about the injuries that happened and the, the technical decisions because of eye pokes. And Joe Rogan went absolutely berserk afterwards talking about how these gloves need to be changed and they need to do things. Uh, you know, you're a striker, but you've really progressed in the grappling and you've gotten really well. You've gotten really good at your wrestling, too. Um do you think there's anything we can do to change the gloves that would not change the your abilities as a grappler while fighting? First of all, I'm a I'm a grappler. I come from a you know I started when I was about six years old doing judo wrestling, also junior high and high school, and then jujitsu. Beyond that, then I picked up striking uh, when I was about 20, 22 years old. Um, so I'm definitely not you know I'm working on my striking game, but. Uh, First thing, yeah, but I mean, okay, I don't, I disagree with Joe Rogan. We're, we're going to look stupid out there. Well, we're going to wear mittens out there and fight. <laughs> <laughs> it's like sarcastic. You're retarded. You're be retarded. Come on, dude. I can't, I, you can't change. You need the open gloves. It has to be that way. It's just, it's, you know, it is what it is. You're it's just going to have to be with it. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's just. Certain guys are going to get it more than others because when they're when they're moving backwards, they you know they tend to stick their hands out and paw out. Uh, I mean, it's it's going to happen. You can't. Put, it really can't put mittens on us. I mean, that's the only option, right? I mean, come on. All right, well, this is Dave. Let me ask you a question here, Luke, then, because we were talking about this earlier on the show, and we've got some conflicting ideas. Do you think that uh, that Bisping's you know, eye poke was intentional or was that accidental? I think it, is, uh, is, it was accidental. I mean, it looked like he had his hand closed and his thumb just stuck out and, and jabbed him in the eye. I mean, why would you do that intentionally after you're beating some guy up the way he, got, the way he was for three rounds? But it was more the fact of, of that right after it happened, he turned to his corner and gave him a big thumbs up and then started pumping his hands in the air, and he was almost celebrating at the injury. Uh I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't see it, man. Uh, Bisming's always pumping himself up, doing that, that stuff before fights and, and everywhere, you know, like, you know, when he's getting greased up. You know, I've, I've trained with Bisming. Uh, he's a he's a, he's a crap talker. You know, he, he runs his mouth a lot, but I don't, I don't think he really, you know, means any harm, you know, and, and uh, he's just physically trying to hurt somebody, like, other than just, you know, legit, legitimate fighting. I, hey, Luke, this is Heidi. I have a interesting question for you. I was watching something that Daniel Cormier had posted on Twitter. You two were at an Earthquakes game. And I know that you're big into all sports. I know that you surf and everything like that. Um, can you tell me what happened with your kick there at the uh, San Jose Earthquakes game <laughs> and the mascot? <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we got number one, ESPN, not top ten. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was a, uh, it was, man, that was like the perfect storm, it, it was, a. Uh, it was funny, the mascot came and, like, looked me in the eye, right before the kickoff, and I was like, I was like, really? <laughs> he, like, kind of, like, like, squared up, popped his chest out, and I was like, all right, all right, it's on! I was like, I'm gonna kick this ball out this guy as hard as I possibly can. Oh, man. And I just, and I, and so I squared up on the ball, and Cormier goes, like, right before me, and I'm, like, I'm just trying to get, like, as much momentum into the kick as possible. And uh, he kicks it, and I come right behind him and just blast as hard as I can. Little do I know, they wet the whole turf. It's, a, it's not even a regular field. It's a turf field. So they wet the whole field down before to, for home team advantage or something. So I immediately, as I make contact with the ball, my plant leg just slips out from underneath me. Wow. I'm on my butt. But then I look up, and thank God the ball hits him directly in the balls to <laughs> cover up my slip. <laughs> Uh, it's ama it's amazing. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing when you can uh, hit two balls with one. It works yeah, out well. Yeah, that's that's better than a bird in the hand, right? It is one of the bush. Well, Luke, I, I got to tell you, I mean, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you this morning. Uh, again, you've got your first UFC fight coming up uh, May 18th. It's the UFC on FX8. It's going to be live from Brazil. Uh, we wish you the best of luck, and we really hope that you'll come back on the program with us after your victory down there uh, in Brazil. Tell us exactly how you did it, how you cut weight, and uh, we'll catch up with you then sounds good guys i'll uh, i'll 
talk to you then. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, Heidi, thanks so much to you for setting up another great interview. That was Luke Rockhold. He is going to be fighting in the UFC on FX8 coming up May 18th. Uh, we've got about 30 seconds before we go to break. Phil, Joey, Heidi, what do you guys think about that whole card? I mean, it's already shaping out. They've got a lot of the slots filled. Uh, it looks like it's going to be a really good fight card. Are you guys excited about this? Yeah, they, yeah. they still have a few for, few more fights to add because you got to get the Ultimate Fighter winners in there. But uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the card. It's going to be a blast. Yeah. Joey, what about you? you? Excited? Oh yeah, man. you look excited. J Jacques Array in the UFC taking on Costa Filippo. This is this is a throwback fight. You know, styles make fights. Your your master grappler versus your slick boxer, and then the main event, man. Rockhold versus the Phenom, it doesn't get any better. No, it sure doesn't. Well, I tell you what, we're going to come back on the MMA Fight Quarter in just about two minutes. Filthy Phil Devine is going to give us this week in MMA history, and we've got a little bit more to talk about this UFC 159 card before we go. You're listening to the MMA Fight Corner here on Fox 920 in Las Vegas and worldwide on FSR920.com.
right, welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner here on Fox Sports 920 in Las Vegas and streaming worldwide on FSR920.com. Dave Carney, Joey Varner, Phil Devine, Heidi Fang in the studio with you. We just got finished talking to Luke Rockhold, who is going to be fighting in the UFC on FX8 coming up May 18th in Brazil, guys. Uh, and, you know, really interesting to me that he doesn't seem concerned about the steroid usage uh, at all. This seems to be something that uh, that Luke is, is just completely nonplussed by. I mean, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, uh, you know, as fighters, as workout guys, would you be upset about that? Well, I, I actually I, I agree with... Uh him right there. Luke is 100% correct when he says that if you look at the history, most guys that test positive for performing enhancing, you know, they lose. usually lose. Yeah. Well, most <laughs> of the time they lose. And, and you know, the body breaks down in a, in a really weird way. I mean, there could be certain things like, you know, Joey and I have talked about, you know, certain HGH and steroid supplements for recovering from injury. But yeah, if you're boosting yourself on PEDs, uh, a lot of times that can take the opposite effect. I mean, look at Tiger Woods. I mean, I know that's not a necessarily confirmed rumor, but the guy's 32 years old, has 16 hip surgeries and four knee surgery. And he plays golf. Okay, but he also got, uh, you know, got awfully big there. So anyways, um, you know, coming back from that, we're going to be talking uh, just really quick. I want to wrap up, uh, you know, the, the whole thing before we go to Phil's uh, this week in MMA history uh, with UFC 159. We're going to go around the horn real quick. We're going to start with Heidi. Any last thoughts on UFC 159, what this card meant to you? Uh, what it meant to me was that even the strange and odd and eerie can happen in the octagon. Um, one, a couple of things I wanted to make note of that we didn't touch on. Leonard Garcia's uh, questionable future after his fifth consecutive loss with the UFC. And also, uh, we kind of mentioned it off air, but I'm not sure if we did on air, that Roy Nelson will get that hopeful run towards the title with either facing Daniel Cormier next who's game for it and also uh, if Mark Hunt beats JDS yeah. he'll get him. Daniel Cormier another guy that Luke Rockhold has uh, has trained with yep. there. so uh, all right Phil what about yourself there my friend New Jersey your semi hometown uh, any lasting thoughts here 159 uh, you know, there was uh, just the unfortunate incidences that it occurred. You know, um, I really would have liked to see the OVP and Gian Vellante fight finish. Um, you know, definitely the Kabalov and Yancey Medeiros. I mm -hmm. mean, to end after one, you know, takedown and a dislocated thumb, you know, that, that really stunk. I, I would have liked to have, because that was a fight we were all really looking forward to. Yeah. Okay. Joey, what about you, man? Ding, 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 winner, winner, chicken dinner. Kim <laughs> Winslow, step aside. We have a new worst referee in all of MMA. What's his first name? Kevin? Kevin, Kevin Mulhall? Kev Kevin Mulhall, who I think, I, I think single-handedly in one <sighs> fight automatically removed himself from the like his likeness character from UFC's next video game. <laughs> That's for sure, dude. Hey, that, that was really the, the eye poke thing. Hey, get, give me a sec. I can't see. You can't see. Oh, you're done. He, no, no, I just said, give me a second. I'm fine now. Nope, it's off. It's over. It's done. Yeah, so is your career, jerk off. Wow. Uh, you know, I, I think for myself personally, you know, what I'm taking away from this is, I, you know, in my opinion, a star was born with Sarah McMahon. Uh, she absolutely dominated Sheila Gaff and looked every bit the Olympic silver medalist that, you know, she was in 2000, I think in four or eight when she w was uh, actually when she won that silver medal. Um, but I mean, what an amazing, amazing fighter. She is going to have an incredible career. So uh, for myself, that was it. Now, Phil, you're going to break us down with this week in MMA history. And I'm really interested to hear what you've got for us this week. Always one of our favorite parts of the of the beginning of the week. Yeah, it's always nice to reminisce sometimes, yes, isn't it? it? Is. Yeah, and what better than on a Monday morning where you don't want to think about uh, the, the real stuff you're doing. So but anyway, uh, Pride 5 took place. It was the first ever Pride event under Dream Stage Entertainment. And it went down April 29th, 1999 in Nagoya, Japan. It was also the Pride debuts of both Mark Coleman and Vitor Belfort. Coleman was submitted by Takata with a heel hook. And Belfort lost the decision to the great Sakuraba. Uh, on UFC uh, 129, St. Pierre vs. Shields took place April 30th, 2001 at the Rogers Center in Toronto, Canada. GSP defended his welterweight title for the sixth time that night when he took the judges' nod over Jake Shields. Former WEC champion Jose Aldo defended his UFC featherweight title for the very first time, taking a decision over Mark Hominick, which also took home fight of the night honors. Knockout of the night went to Leoto Machida with his crane kick to Randy Couture. Ouch. Uh, and the submission of the night went to Pablo Garza with a beautiful flying triangle win over Yves Jabin. A quick note also, 
UFC debut of Ben Smooth Henderson and the final fight of Randy Couture's career. Ooh, and also the last time the janitor won in the UFC. And now Over he's Jason Brills that <laughs> night. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Now he's in Bellator. Bellator yeah. dreams. Yeah. Now the finals of the very first Pride Open Weight Grand Prix happened May 1st, 2000 in the Tokyo Dome in Japan. And it was the first ever Pride event broadcast here in America. It was also Ken Shamrock's return to mixed martial arts after a four-year hiatus while doing the WWE. And it was what they used to heavily promote the card here to the American viewers. Shamrock was booked in a super fight with a Japanese wrestling star named Alexander Atsuka. He won the fight by KO. But the main event of, uh, of the main attraction of the card was the quarter and semifinals in the tournament. In the quarterfinal bouts, Igor Vovchechkin beat Gary Goodridge by KO. Fujita took a decision over Mark Carr. Coleman got the decision over Shiji. Sakuraba handed Hoist Gracie his very first MMA loss when Hoist could minutes. not continue after the sixth round. Sixth round of 15 minute rounds each. Crazy. 90 minutes of fighting. And Hoist wore a gi in there and Sakuraba took full advantage of that. He said, you've got, I mean, that's just, that, that's, that's asinine. Absolutely, yeah. It was first loss after, he was gone for five years too. Now in the semifinal round later that night, Vochanchkin defeated Sakuraba after it went to sudden death and the Gracie Hunter <laughs> couldn't, his corner threw in the towel because he couldn't continue. Coleman got a pass in the semis when Fujita couldn't fight due to the injuries that he suffered in the Kerr fight. And uh, Mark Coleman beat Vochanchin in the uh, finals, finishing him with a barrage of knees to become the very first ever Pride Grand Prix champion. And then uh, Hoist and um, Sakuraba, didn't they rematch? Like yeah, years later? it was really interesting. Well, is that Sakuraba did it. Yeah, no, they uh, did. They fought again, and th that was when uh, Hoist won, but he tested steroids. positive oh, for steroids. Right. Yeah. But what was really interesting, if you look back at this event, uh, they were s s put in the same bracket because Sakuraba had beaten Hoist's older brother. They wanted to regain the Gracie name. So what they did is they demanded to be put in the tournament, but they didn't give Sak him Sakuraba in the first round. They gave him in the second, second round. So they made a little bit of an adjustment to the rules, saying no referee was able to stop the fight and that there would be no, uh, no time limits. So it went to 90 minutes. That's insane. For, you, you know, you see two guys going in and at it for 90 minutes. Look at what happens after one guy goes at it for five minutes. <laughs> all right? You know, it, it's hard enough. Um, UFC 31, locked and loaded, shook up Atlantic City, New Jersey, on May 4th, 2001. And it was just the second UFC card under the new Zufa banner. It was also the UFC debuts of future welterweight champions BJ Penn and Matt Serra. Penn stopped Joey Gilbert with punches with just two seconds left in the first round. And Sarah, on the other hand, while way on his, well on his way to a decision victory, but with just eight seconds left in the fight, Shoney Carter delivered one of the highlight reel spinning back fists we see all the time and uh, ruined that debut. Do you, do you remember his boxer shorts are like falling out of he had boxer <laughs> shorts under like a speedo and they were falling out of the speedo <laughs> and the bot the speedo was like wasn't it like all these different flags of, of different countries because he was it, mr international yeah it, it was a very bad what well, you see that's the ultimate confusion boxer or briefs and <laughs> it, you know right there it's just it's still up in he the air he was torn he was literally <laughs> uh kevin randleman made his ufc debut uh, his ufc i'm sorry light heavyweight debut that night after he lost the heavyweight title to randy couture in his previous fight Things didn't go that uh, as planned for the monster because he was matched up against future Hall of Famer Chuck Liddell, and the Iceman knocked him out with just 78, it just 78 seconds into the fight. Uh, longtime welterweight champion Pat Militich lost his championship belt that night when he was submitted by Carlos Newton, and also that night Randy Couture defended his heavyweight title, making taking a judge's decisions over Pedro Hizo. Wait, I might have missed this, but did you also mention that it was the debut of BJ Penn? It, yes, I did. Oh, sorry, B I BJ Penn that. and Matt Sarah. Sorry about that. Uh, Pride total elimination absolute went down on May 5th, 2006 in the Osaka Dome in Japan. It was the first round of the 2006 15-man openweight tournament. That night, Verdum submitted Alistair Overeem with a Kimura. Uh, uh, Hunt stopped Koshaka with heavy punches. Josh Barnett used an, an Americana to beat Alexander Emelianenko, and Big Nog submitted Zulu Husino with an armbar. Uh, Fujita knocked out jo uh, James Thompson, the Colossus, and uh, 
Mirko Krokop stopped uh, Minowa Man just 70 seconds into the fight. All seven of those winners moved on to Pride Critical Countdown Absolute, which we'll talk about in July. Okay, well, <laughs> here's, here's something I think that should get added back into this week at MMA History for future weeks, and it has to do with Chuck Liddell. Did you guys get a chance to see the new Chuck Liddell commercial for, 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 for Budweiser? What uh, Wasn't it Budweiser? Miller Lite. Miller Lite. Miller Lite, Miller Lite. Yeah, excuse me. Where he, if you bring him with him, you get... Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, they, yeah, they're going around and they're partying and yeah. they're bringing, bringing the pain. And I just thought, wow, this is the greatest thing here. Chuck Liddell looks so personable. He's going to have his own show soon. That was a hilarious, hilarious, uh, you know, piece of commercial advertising. Very well done by our beer friends. That's the, they always come up with good stuff. But using Chuck like that was brilliant. Yeah, it certainly was. And finally, we got two quick ones. WEC 20, Cinco de Mayhem, rocked the Tai Chi Palace in Lemoore, California on May 5th. Tai Chi Palace, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and every fight uh, but one ended in the first round. Eddie Wineland became the inaugural WEC Bantamweight champion when he stopped Antonio Bunduelas in the first round. Nate Diaz, Rob McCullough, and Glover Teixeira were all on that card and won in the first round. And last, last year. The third UFC on Fox went down in the swamps of East Rutherford, New Jersey on May 5th. Every fight but one on the prelims went to a decision, and every fight on the main card but one ended in a finish. Main card winners included LeVar Johnson, Alan Belcher, Johnny Hendricks, and Nate Diaz. Bonuses went to LeVar Johnson for his knockout of the night over Pat Barry. Fight of the night went to flyweights Louis Galdenau and John Linklicker. L Linker. <laughs> Lineker, sorry. Lineker. <laughs> Lineker. Uh, Lineker. How and screwed up without, 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 that was your last name, Link Licker. Yeah, say that three times. Lineker. Fast. And the submission of the night went to Nate Diaz when he became the very first person to ever submit who? Jim, Jim Miller. Miller. You know what? That's little known fact, Phil Devine there. We're going to have 16 nicknames for you by the time this show's over. All right, so for Phil Devine, Joey Varner, Heidi Fang, I'm Dave Carney. Thanks so much for staying with us here on the MMA Fight Corner on Fox Sports 920 and worldwide on FSR920.com. We'll see you guys here Friday night, 5 p.m. on Fox Sports.